Welcome to drones, satellites, and other futuristic vineyard technology. We're going to be talking about kind of where the state of technology is in the vineyards. Uh, obviously, we can't cover literally everything, but we're going to kind of cover things that I think are relevant, uh, things that are here and not quite effective, and then also things that are coming. And the goal really is going to be have a major focus on practical outcomes, things that can be implemented. And we'll talk more about that in a bit. So first... Uh, to read this quote, modern technology is a total phenomenon of the entire civilization, the defining force of a new social order in which efficiency is not just an option, but a necessity imposed upon every human activity. Propaganda seduces people into consenting to this. The mass media are the tools of propaganda, creating the illusion that people are free and creative when in fact they are mind-numbingly conformed to the principles of efficient ordering by Robert Inkowski. I want to start with that. That maybe seems bleak or a little odd for a vineyard presentation on technology. But because I do, this is something I firmly believe, especially when talking about technology, that we are not slaves to technology, that we are not pursuing endless efficiency for the sake of efficiency, technology for the sake of technology. Um, so in that talk, I really want this to be uh, in our mind, or at least for you to understand that this is in my mind, that I think technology is a very powerful tool, in many cases a necessary tool, but we are not Technology is not the end. It is better farming, more sustainable farming, more profitable farming, uh, better farming overall. That is what we are after. Uh, we are not in service of technology, but technology is in service of, to us. And to that note, I actually think there's a there's an efficient model I talk about, or, or sorry, a um, model of te uh, technological adoption that probably going to get me in a bit of trouble here. But I think, and this is a huge generalization, but I think is on a decent way of describing what's going on. And I call it the French versus the California model, or you almost could say the French versus the Silicon Valley model. In the California model technology, you have find a solution and now you need to find a problem. So you figure out some sort of new technology and now you need to figure out, well, who needs this technology? We've created something. What do we do with it? Uh, you see this a lot when people talk about being Uber for X or Facebook for Y. I hear this a lot where all of a sudden we're just taking a technology. And now we're just trying to find some other way to create a solution for it. Uh, if you're a farmer, you've definitely experienced this lots. We saw this lots early on with drones where people were coming in. They were drone pilots. They had these cool new drones. You know, this is maybe 10 -ish years ago. And they bought a, you know, NDVI or multispectral camera. And they're like, okay, we can go do this for you or with, even with satellites and they'd come to farms and they'd say, okay, well do NDVI for you. They knew nothing about farming, but they'd hand you a map and be like, okay, uh, cool. What do I do with this? Uh, and this is where, at least in our industry in the Okanagan, there were, to my knowledge, three drone companies and they're all gone. And now, as far as I know, we're the only operating uh, drone company here. Um, and that's because I think this initial mindset was we have a solution drones, super cool, but we actually don't even know what the problem is. Uh, another example, we had this with our client where uh, someone had a sensor uh, in the field for them, this kind of cool new sensor supposedly, and then it died. And our clients went back to them and said, listen, like we, this can't die this quickly, that it's not usable if it, you know, we have to replace the battery every week. And they said, oh, can't you just plug it in? To which, of course, clients responded, oh, it's in the middle of a vineyard. Uh, there's no plugs in the middle of a vineyard. And they were saying, oh, okay, uh, can you just run an extension cord to it? Uh, I think this is uh, what happens when you have a sol a solution mindset. When you have a you have the solution and you don't know what the problem is. This is where you'll be interacting with people bringing you solutions. They don't speak your language. They don't know the ins and outs of your industry. And this is the California model. Contrast it with the French model, where the idea is we have a problem. We've encountered something. I see this a lot. A lot of the times when we're looking for new technology for vineyards, we'll look to France, not because it's France, but because you have a lot of people there who take have this a mindset. And again, huge generalization, but they have you have farmers, you have people who are in the field who have run into a problem and now need a solution. That's the French model. What we call I call the French model. You have a problem. I now need to find a solution, and that's the approach we try and take as well. But again, the ultimate goal of this is to identify problems and then look for solutions that map onto those problems, not the other way around in a way that serves us, not that, that serves technology. Uh, just this is a chat GPT. I thought this was pretty funny, appropriate. Uh, I asked it, uh, how do you make great wine? And I won't read the whole thing. 
uh, just kind of funny. Uh, overall, this is a, not a bad answer. Overall, making great wine requires a relentless pursuit of excellence, a commitment to continuous improvement, and a willingness to embrace new technologies and techniques. By focusing on these core principles, wine growers can create exceptional wines that stand out in a competitive market. Not a bad mar answer. Of course, it's not actually uh, that useful. Moving on. So here's what we're going to talk about. We have three topics. Uh, we're probably in ascending order of time. Spraying, irrigation, we're going to move through pretty quickly. Uh, and you'll see why. Multispectral is where we're going to spend our time. That's a drone or satellite. Uh, just because that is where I think most of the benefit is going to be. Uh, so, and here's our goals kind of in roughly the next 30 minutes. Uh, first of all, I'm going to provide a map. So what, what I want you to get out of this is I'm going to speed through a lot of the technical elements because most of you don't really need to know. If You, you can dive in, happy to answer questions. You can reach me at chris at vitality.com. Uh, you can call me, happy to talk about some of the more technical elements. But for the vast majority of people, uh, that's not necessary. And so what I want to do is I want to get, and so I'm, we're going to burn through a lot of this. You're not going to completely understand it. I don't want you, don't need you to. The goal is to give you kind of a map of the area, a map of the landscape. So you can orient yourself. You can ask the right questions. If you're pursuing this, you want to explore this, some of these technologies more deeply, you know where to go. You know what to look for. You know some of the questions to ask. Yes, you don't fully understand it, but again, you don't need to. We don't need to do a deep dive. Uh, it's not relevant to most of you. So I'm, so the first goal of this talk is just to give you a, a very broad map so you know what the landscape is, you know what the area that we're talking about looks like. We will zoom in on some points of interest and go a bit deeper, but that's the first goal. The second and the third goals, I want this to be practical and actionable. That is to say, I want you to, there's things that you can leave here that are both useful to you. This is not just theoretical. I'm not primarily presenting research. I'm hoping for this to be just hyper useful and actionable. That is to say, there are actions you can take from today's talk, things you can do in your farm, in your winemaking uh, to really help uh, do that. And then just the fourth goal, which is not technically actually a goal, but it's just, I really want to stress that vines are different. Uh, this kind of may seem obvious if you work in a vineyard, but I think we often forget vines are quite seriously how we farm vines. The nature of vines are quite different from most crops. First of all, the perennials, Obviously, also the quality, there are many things we do in terms of quality that you would not do with any other crop. Water stress being a great example. There are very few other crops that I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head that use water stress to produce higher quality fruit. And we have quite clear research, uh, pr quite definitive that that is the case, especially for reds. If you want higher quality reds, some level of water stress is really uh, typically necessary. Um, whether whether that's uh, implicit or uh, intentional, you know, whether that's intentional or just by nature. But Vines are different, so therefore when we're looking, uh, the rows also pose a huge problem, but therefore when we're looking at technology and research, we need to make sure we interpret it correctly for vines, because this is not the same as general broad acre crops, orchards, orchards. there are key differences uh, that make this much more difficult, but also more lucrative when appropriately applied. applied. So that's it, map, practical, actionable, vines are different. Uh, I also want to touch on, just as also as part of a preface, uh, why tech implementation fails. I know a lot, all of us have employed new technologies and it hasn't worked. I got to give credit here to Michael Kanick, a good friend of mine who does an amazing job with uh, strategic management. He would get upset with me if I said strategic planning because as he's like to say, uh, management is a process and that's what it takes. So I've borrowed his slide here, but I think this all holds true for tech implementation. That is to say, if you want to use different technologies, they need to be organized into your processes. It doesn't matter what technology it is. It could be a soil sensor. It needs to integrate into your broader mission. Uh, it needs to be part of, you need to understand how to implement it in terms of your goals and results that you are after. It's not as simple as just getting a result and then hoping it kind of fixes things. It has to be well thought out. You have to have an idea for what you want out of that technology. And so I think this is actually a really useful slide uh, in just in terms of understanding how to maximize any sort of technological implementation. Uh, I think this is a really good tool for that. Uh, and then the last element of preface, I just want to talk about how uh, vineyards have bigger, more soil heterogeneity than you expect. So here what you're looking at is a single small vineyard in uh, the Soyuz Oliver area, this is considered just a sandy soil, uh, typical, you know, very homogenous. But actually, when we want, did and uh, dug soil pits, 
what we found was that it was actually much more varied than we expected. You can see this in the photos, both in some of the color differences, in rooting depth, in moisture levels, uh, in compaction. All of these were, again, this is you know a, a small vineyard of a number of acres. This is not significant. And yet we have significant variability in that vineyard. Even though when you look at it, if you dug a shovel in the ground, you would say it was very homogenous. Actually, there's significant variability that has a big impact on the quality and what you're gonna get out of that fruit. And we know again from research that even small differences in sand percentage, for example, in the sand fraction can have a significant input impact on the fruit quality, fruit uh, parameters, the wine you get off, off that site. If you blend it all together, that will disappear. But if you're looking for intra-block quality, if you're looking for premium fruit, uh, this is really important. So let's move on. Let's start talking about spraying. So first of all, we're going to talk about drone spraying. Uh, this is super cool. If you've ever seen this done, it's pretty awesome. The idea is you have a drone. Uh, you, it will automate now. The drones will automatically map out your vineyards. So you're not having to fly. They'll know where your rows are, so it gets all mapped out. It takes a little bit of time and money, but once it's mapped, you're done. And then it will fly the whole thing automatically. So it will spray whatever you fill its water tank with, or its tank spray tank with. It will fly that vineyard back and forth automatically. Come back dock for battery replacement charging and for tank refill and do so automatically so in theory all you have to do is have someone there to refit the batteries and refill the tank there are a couple of key challenges though where i think drone spraying is not where it needs to be specifically especially for vineyards and we're probably a few years away from it becoming really viable first of all the small tank obviously the very nature of your flying something it can't have a huge tank so refills it is saving you labor in one sense but you do need someone there to uh refill the tank because of the fact that it just can't have a large one so it will come back to you automatically but someone needs to handle that also currently legally in canada you can't spray any sides like fungicides uh or the pesticides anything like that probably is going to change soon but that's currently the issue and then third and what i actually think is most important and the real limitation is if you have a non-split canopy that is to say typically if you have a vsp vertical canopy the big challenge is that nozzle angle to get good penetration. We spend a lot on our foliar sprayers to make sure that they're doing everything they can to get an equal uh, penetration of the for, through that full canopy, all the leaves, especially as your vegetation gets dense. And just currently, because you can angle the nozzles a little bit, but the drone needs to fly above the canopy. It can't fly in between because if you have any tendrils or anything like that, uh, it's going to catch on a rotor. So you just have a straight tendril. It's, it'll catch on a rotor. And then all of a sudden, it, it can, it'll can it clip it potentially. And then your 16,000 drone smashes into the ground. So you typically, you're going to have to fly above the canopy, which means you're angled down, uh, which means that some of that penetration, especially for things you really want to get on, coat on all the leaves, uh, is going to be lacking. Obviously, there are some cases where that's not as much an issue, where you're maybe sp some specific micronutrients, you're happy to get that on. Uh, just kind of younger leaves but again for the amount of time and effort uh, that value is not quite there yet it should get there hopefully you're seeing this a lot with orchards where this is much less of an issue but it's not there yet for vines the next and very related option is robot spraying so here is kind of the opposite now you have a little robot that's going through the vineyard um, if you end up with an automatic tractor one of those uh you know um robot tractors there's you know and you're spending that at that point there are uh, robot sprayers that can obviously be worth it because effectively your robot is your tractor but in the case where you're not spending money on a very expensive robot tractor uh, you have one of these little robots it has a lot of the similar challenges of a drone sprayer uh, the nice thing is it's not in the air but still you need now to map the vineyard it you know needs to understand how to go up and down rows this is a huge challenge we've experienced this for uh, vineyards uh, with some of our own technology that rows are actually a bigger challenge than you would think with a lot of this technology a lot of this has been going on in broad acre much easier much bigger challenge uh, for any sort of spraying um, i should also mention that one of the uh, big advantages of both these approaches of course is you're getting people outside of any spraying so in terms of health issues you don't have people in the vineyard for it which is a huge advantage uh, but again, with the robot sprayer, the on the ground sprayer, you're still having all the same challenges or essentially the same challenges as the drone sprayer. Small tank, you have to map the vineyard, uh, penetration, getting a good angle, um, you know, getting good uh, coverage for the vine with the VSP system is very difficult. So 
let's talk about precision fertilization. It's been really interesting to me that we don't see more wide adoption within viticulture because it is so widely adopted within general agriculture, broad acre farming and the like, uh, because there is, I think, a strong return on it. Obviously, sustainably being able to reduce total fertilizer use is a big win, but then also increases in yield and quality, I think, have been quite uh, clearly demonstrated by research it makes sense because we have such heterogeneous fields typically we have so much variability uh, so we for example have developed our own prototype we've been trialing uh, in a research uh, system with Dr. Simone Castellar and at UBC our first year we saw a 30% reduction in nitrogen use uh, with no impact on yield or quality so I think that's this is just one example uh, there's currently no other system I know I've been able to find that's operating, but I think you absolutely, whether it's our system or other people's system, this is the approach to take. So whether it is like our system, it's a trailer, or the other way to go about this is say what Verity is doing, where you have these micro zones, you're creating sub zones within your blocks by putting in valves, which obviously then is fertigation. The big challenge with the trailer is of course, you're dragging a trailer, uh, you know, even a small one like ours through a vineyard, which, you know, versus fertigation is really, really nice. So if you can kind of, create those zones appropriately with say a Verity system, then you can do the fertigation, which is also very convenient. Both obviously have their pluses and minuses. Uh, I'd say the big challenge overall is there are lots of positive results for precision fertilization, but you have to be intentional. It's a bit more time consuming because you need to think and plan how you actually want to target this fertilization, whether it's just by zones and varietals, whether you want to use soil mapping or NDVI or other, or other variables. So it does make things a bit more complicated. So there, again, this is one where I think you really need a return, have a plan on what benefit this is going to bring you, whether it's yield or quality, things like that. And again, I don't think there's a perfect system out there yet for this. And I think you're going to see a lot more precision fertilization. I think this is something really to pay attention and start thinking about uh, how to you know, be more targeted with your fertilization because we are unquestionably significantly over fertilizing, especially in the Okanagan. That would be a whole other talk. Uh, but I can tell you just as, you know, in the work we see, the people we talk to, there's uh, looking just a published research, there's no question we significantly over fertilize. So let's talk a bit about what's coming. So first of all, we talked on uh, robotic tractors. I don't think we need to say much here. We're starting to see some implementation in some vineyards. Obviously, the rows have been a big challenge. You've had robot, you're seeing more robots in Broadacre. But I think the return is going to be uh, unlikely unless you're a very, very large farm uh, in the near future. We're also seeing automatic harvesting. And I think, again, it's the same way. Um, I think most vineyards now that are being put in are being built for mechanization because of labor challenges in the Okanagan, which I think is smart, uh, where appropriate. But I think even then it's hard to justify robotic tractors or harvesting. But we will see more of it. Um, and if you're not in the Okanagan, obviously this is something a you very large scale. I think there can be value there. The third thing is weed zapping or automatic weed robot robotic weed pulling. The really cool ones are where they use machine learning to identify weeds and then they go and zap them with lasers and things like that to kill them uh, right at the root. Again, the challenge is the return. You really need to have a real use case. Uh, the technology isn't there yet. It's still being trialed. It's not commercially ready. But uh, I think this is something that, you know, potentially could save you a lot of time, reduce herbicide. I think there are real benefits. We're also seeing, you know, this is not truly a robot, but UV from mildew. Where th at night, if you may have seen these, they got these big UV panels. They're pulling down uh, the rows so that they're blasting the uh, vines with UV. Blasting maybe makes it sound more uh, destructive than it is, but it is seems to be quite effective at, at killing or minimizing mildew without then having to result to uh, sprays and things like that. So again, I think this is, some, this is something that's out there right now. Um, that is, if you're really concerned about mildew and looking for alternatives, this is a technology that might be worth investing in. The fifth and final thing is just automatic imaging. So you're just seeing these robots that are going through and targeting automatically. Uh, we'll talk about some of this a bit more with LiDAR, but they're you know finding clusters, targeting clusters, giving you numbers. I don't think the value is here yet. Um, it's gonna have to get quite a bit cheaper, but I think eventually you'll have these robots that could go through your vineyard inexpensively and get you images of, and not just pictures, but you can get cluster sizes, counts, um, even, you know, local NDVI or thermal water stress measurements, uh, just with a robot you kind of send out, you know, kind of like a little doggy, which I think is kind of cool. Okay. Uh, this is one question we had come in, uh, just on drones and animals. Uh, you know, this is for BC. I am not a lawyer. I'm not giving you legal advice, 
but people have asked about scaring away things like bears with drones, even mounting noise on the drones themselves, or I can, you know, or just using the drone as a way to scare away a bear. I can tell you potentially from personal experience, maybe, maybe not, that uh, drones will scare away bears. Bears do not like them. They'll first be curious, and then if you get a little close, they will run away. So if you are uh, being threatened by a bear, uh, it can, even a small drone, even just one of those little DJI camera drones will scare away a bear. Um, of course, none of this is going to be automated. You need to be up and use it to chase the bear away. I can't promise that 100% of bears are scared of drones, but I may or may not have seen drones run away from bears that were getting a little close for comfort. Um, so that is an option. Uh, my, in terms of noise, it's a bylaw complaint or sorry, a bylaw issue. Again, I, I can't comment, but based on my research and talking to some colleagues, it generally seems okay. I mean, if you can use a propane cannon mounting something on a drone, there are drones that have attachments you can purchase for noise making. Uh, so that is an option. Okay, let's get into irrigation. So, uh, weather stations and ET modeling. I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time here just because, uh, you know, we're just not seeing huge improvement. Weather stations are getting better, but, you know, this is something, again, people want to talk about because we're doing a lot of work on irrigation. Um, I'll just make a couple comments that are just kind of broad irrigation technology uh, comments. I think, first of all, a lot of people who are using ET alone, I'm just very skeptical when I look at the research, when I've talked to people who've compared ET within their own farms to other more state, more accurate measurements using like simeters or other metrics, they find ET can vary a huge amount. And this makes sense because what you have to remember about evapo, you know, using a uh, evapotranspiration calculation, say from your weather station, is that there are a lot of variables that actually go into it. It is not a simple, straightforward calculation. And even small changes or errors in that calculation can produce huge uh, variability. So talking to one farmer, they found at the end of the year compared to more, a more accurate, a more direct method of water stress, 60% uh, variation from the ET model by the end of the year, which is just not useful. So, you know, this is not to say not to use ET. I think it's a very useful tool, but keep in mind, it really needs to be properly calibrated and checked. You need some other metric to check against, which, you know, we're doing a lot of work. This is a big challenge. What do you, how and how do you check it against other metrics? So it's uh, just something to keep in mind. Um, the cool thing that I'm, I think we see coming with kind of weather stations and things like this is machine learning is really producing some useful advances, which is going to be a common theme here. So it's not a specific technology, but I think it, or, or, or result, but I think this is just something really to look for that some of these services that were not as useful before are now we're finding more, you know, that this data that we're able to kind of analyze in this completely new way is really useful. And because of that, I think we're starting to see some cool new metrics around pests and mildew uh, modeling, things like that uh, are coming online. So uh, some might be here or we're getting here. We're, you know, looking at some uh, and you're seeing this kind of crop up a lot more. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, soil sensors. So another irrigation. Uh, this is a common question we got as well. Um, big challenge with soil sensors is how you actually correlate it to plant demand. Uh, they sensors need to be calibrated, and the difficult, which is difficult, and the errors can be quite large. Um, this is again our experience, both talking to scientists, talking to uh, experts who have you know been using tons of different soil sensors. Is it really seems like there's kind of a three models. That are really that do a really good job of publishing calibration, uh, public data on their sensors, um, research, and it's Delta T and Stevens seem to be the two best, followed by Meter, uh, who make uh, weather stations and soil sensors and all that stuff. So those three, in our opinion, are the best that are the most rigorous, where you're going to get the get the best data. We know a lot of people use AquaCheck. Um, I'm not. It was. I've not been able to find good data supporting their use. Uh, I found one paper that found they were around. I think it was around 60% accurate. Um, you know, obviously that. You know, there's quite a bit of variability. Uh, supposedly they have calibrations, but again, I. You know, I've talked to people who just tested and have just found their calibrations did not work very well. So this is just you know not to discourage all sensors at all, but it is not as straightforward as you would think. Never mind interpreting the graphs. Um, making sure you're at the right depths that you, you know, so this is, I just want to be really careful. If you just throw a soil sensor or soil probe in your ground, uh, unfortunately we're not there yet where you're just going to get good data off of that, especially based depending on the sensor you use. Again, some are going to be better than others. And if you're unsure, Delta T Stevens meter are more likely to give you a high quality sensor, um, especially with proper calibration. 
the other thing I thought I'd mention is there's other tools out there like Plant Sap, and I just can't definitively say it works great or it works poorly. First of all, they're expensive. Second of all, it's really unclear if Plant Sap actually correlates with, I mean, it seems obvious and intuitive, but if it actually really correlates with plant uh, hydration status, plant water stress status, it is actually nowhere near as close, unfortunately, as we would like to think it is. So some people uh, have said they love them. Some people think they're you know, really not useful. So this all comes to the challenge of what, how we actually accurately measure plant water stress. Obviously you can use a pressure sensor or, or a um, pressure bomb, uh, you know, which also depends on when you're using it. So it, it's a harder question to answer than you would think. And I would just, one thing I would say is that observation alone is absolutely not enough. Uh, huge, huge errors in using observation or just digging a shovel in the ground. Again, like better, like absolutely worth doing both of those things, observing your vineyard, you know, feeling the soil, 100% worth doing. But if that's your only method, uh, there's quite a big error range in, the, you know, a bigger error range in that. Um, and unfortunately, there's nothing super cool coming down the pipe on this stuff right now. Um, you know, again, we're doing some work on modeling, which we're excited about. But, you know, again, it, it's, you know, there's no huge new solution that I can point to, uh, even that's just around the corner. Um, we have companies like ours and many others that are offering you know, trying to offer new solutions, but there's nothing that is going to be perfect or revolutionary at this stage. Oh, and I will say before I start talking about the wireless sensor networks, thermal cameras as well. We're going to talk a bit more about thermal later, but that's another way to assess water stress that actually might be pretty good. Um, and we'll talk about that a bit more later. So, but that's a bit of a different approach. Okay. So the thing that is a wireless WSN wireless sensor network, the thing that it has had a huge improvement is how we communicate. So there's something called LoRa, you don't really care, uh, Wi-Fi, but these things actually make a big difference um, behind the scenes. So while they're not going to make our irrigation better, how things communicate, uh, how they speak to each other is a big change. So I'm not gonna spend much time here, but just to tell you that this is kind of unsexy, it's more just of a technical improvement, but it does mean that for all you having cell phone drop or cell dropouts or other communication challenges, or you're in the middle of a field, now you can use Starlink, uh, which works great. Um, you know, we've used in pretty remote places with great success. So to bring you Wi-Fi at an actually decently affordable rate. So, you know, again, all this is just saying this is not sexy, but this is where we've seen some major improvements. Okay, let's start talking about multispectral. And the reason I'm going to be talking about this is because this is where this is something that was sexy and new 10 years ago. And now it really in the last few years, really, is, I think has become actually, pro, you know, profitably valuable um, for vineyards. Now, before we start talking about multispectral, I really want to preface this that even if you're not going to get multispectral data done with a satellite or with a drone, there's actual real value in the work we're about to talk about because what the, multi, the goal is in the end isn't NDVI or other multispectral data. The goal is the result you get from it. And so what, what these services, these multispectral uh, techniques are letting us do is just an easier way to get to the end result we want. So an example of that would be multispec is great for creating management zones. This is something that's hugely valuable for a vineyard to actually realize that your vineyard variability is not nice and easy and assigned into blocks. The soil heterogeneity, climate heterogeneity, all, all flows not relative to how you designed your blocks, but many other variables. So what multi-spec or other remote sensing like electrical conductivity does is it tells you where that variability actually is because it always cross, you know, it's never contained by blocks unless you designed your vineyard first the whole that way initially, which makes life a bit easier. So all multi-spec is doing or is, is allowing you to find the variability and identify variability throughout your vineyard in a way that is going to make it easier to manage labor, uh, find premium fruit, increase yields, monitor yields, all these kind of things. But again, the goal is not the multi-spec. The goal is the manage management zone. There are other ways to get to the management zone. And what's the goal of the management zone? It's labor saving. It's again, finding premium fruit. It's all these other things. So we're going to talk about that, but I think it's important to recommend the multi-spec is just getting us to this result or getting us, it's helping us identify this tool. You could create management zones on your own using other sensors or approaches or even manually. Uh, Multi-spec or ec electrical conductivity ECR are gonna be better at it, but this is not something that you actually have to use this technology for. Uh, so again, the, the end result is not 
we're not here for multi-spec, we're here for other results. And so I think there's actually, even if you have no interest in using multispectral data, I actually think there's some real value here to be had. And keep in mind, again, a lot of what we're talking about too relates to plant health and research. So when we're saying NDVI does this or that, what we're really talking about is how it relates to plant metrics management, all this stuff. So again, I want to be really clear. The value here is not just multispectral. It's actually th how we're thinking, you know, there's, there's solutions is bringing more broadly than that. So first of all, just what is multispectral? Here's our drone. Uh, you see the camera there, it has five lenses. How multispectral works, and it's similar for a satellite, right? So I'm just looking at a drone here, but this is a similar concept for a satellite, is that it has five lenses. Well, that part's a tiny bit different, but the general idea is the same. So you have five lenses, each corresponds to a specific wavelength. So you have your typical red, green, blue, and then you have red edge and near infrared, and those are non-visible. And the reason we really care about those is because the plant plants emit light in the red edge and near infrared spectrum. Red edge correlates beautifully with chlorophyll. That's where we really start to see chlorophyll. Near infrared, you can see health metrics week or weeks earlier than visibly, where a plant will start senescing or or suffering signs of disease and pests in near infrared uh, before you could see it within you know visible light. So what this does. If we look at this, is we have these. This has four. This image has four layers. The camera there is five, so you normally see five, but this is too good an image to use. And so you have these. It just takes like five pictures at once, each within this different layer. And so then all we're doing, when say we're calculating NDVI, NDVI is just a calculation. It's just an algorithm. It's just near infrared minus red divided by near infrared plus red. That's all that NDVI is. And so it's just all you're doing is subtracting these layers to create an image. That is the is the result of that cal of that number. You just, it, that that calculation just gives you a number, and that's your NDVI. And usually it's between zero and one, uh, if it matters. But what NDVI is really telling you is two other things. This is kind of NDVI is really telling you what is the total plant biomass or vigor level. So you can think of NDVI's vigor. Uh, and some people have taken that a step further and said what actually NDVI is is it soil water, uh, whether you know, natural or through irrigation plus texture or soil depth, depending on your site. So it's just water plus texture is what NDVI actually is measuring. And that's what's giving you vigor. So this is NDVI's vigor is a simple way to think about it. And this is what processing looks like. I don't actually expect you to uh, follow this just to give an idea. This is kind of what goes into the work to get to something we can understand. And, and really it's fly, process, interpret, implement with kind of different tools. And that's there are actually clear ways we can improve the service uh, flying uh, by we getting better platforms and sensors. We're getting better satellite sensors. We're getting better drone sensors, better drones, things like that, improving our algorithms, improving the research we have, and obviously educating users uh, about what you can do with this information. So now here, let's, this is something we're, we're going to spend a little bit more time on is what you can do with this data. First of all, yield. Um, I've been always a little bit surprised by this. It's not something I necessarily expected, but you can get the most accurate information in terms of predicting yield from NDVI or NDRE or whatever, um, you know, including up to the next year. So uh, for example, Dr. Terry Bates in some of his testing, so he does a lot of work, he's a well-known uh, viticulture, viticulture researcher, wine researcher, um, I think it's Cornell, and they found, you know, sometimes 3% accuracy using NDVI as a predictor of yield. So again, they're within 3% often in terms of what that prediction looks like. There was some research done in, in Portugal, and I'm actually just going off the top of my head here, but I think they did it uh, in April or May, something like that at a regional scale. So they were using satellite for this. And they were like 90% accurate uh, for all these farms in the area in terms of actual yield. I think up to a year and a half later, uh, this data was able to be used. So it really is in terms of yield prediction, um, planning, things like that, uh, there's a big advantage. Uh, you can also use the data to increase yields, which is a whole nother talk, um, or, or you know, we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, labor savings, because of how you prune when you're looking at an NDVI map, identifying weak areas, um, how you're gonna plan and target ripening, what areas you're gonna ripen first, um, management zones, so this is one, something we've touched on already. I think this is a, hu you know, a huge value for any vineyard. You can get this through EC or through multispectral, but it's actually breaking your vineyard into subzones. So we know, oh, this area is going to ripen earlier. 
Uh, this area, we should look for premium fruit. We'll expect this area, you know, so you have one block, say you have Cabernet Sauvignon, and we'll say, actually, this there's actually a block is split. There's a some sort of different climate, soil texture, whatever, within the block. And so this half of the block, see the southern half, uh, actually is going to ripen earlier. It's going to have higher sugar levels, higher alcohol, obviously, and all these other factors. And therefore you should actually maybe pick them a little bit differently. Pick part of it a little bit earlier or later. And you'll actually, if you want, you could actually use one half or higher quality fruit to make a higher quality wine at a higher, you know, at a higher price point. And this is where I think um, there's real value in this kind of information. Uh, as well, we have year to year data. So this is also really useful is actually monitoring how your vineyard is doing holistically. Obviously super important to be in the, the vineyard. But having a bird's eye view that's objective every year to look to, you can. it's really interesting to look back at a vineyard, say, four years before and go, oh, shoot, look, this problem is there, was here, which we've done with clients. It was here then. Uh, so I think even looking at historical information on your vineyard, uh, which you can get either if you've been working with someone for a while or if you have satellite data, sometimes you can get historical pictures of your site. Uh, it's actually a really useful way to assess how you're developing and managing that site. Uh, targeted fertilization, we talked a bit about this, but obviously uh, you, this is really something we see commonly used in France. Uh, this is one of the common uses. Andy is quite popular there or multispectral and they'll use it where if they have weaker areas they wanna bring up to increase yields or if they wanna target for quality parameters to use these maps. Uh, and then the last one is just premiumization, which we've talked touched on a bit with management zones. Uh, but again, the idea here is that you're really where that highest quality fruit comes from is not consistent. It's not, you know, although for simplicity, we'll say, oh, it's, you know, block B gives me my highest quality Pinot Noir. Actually, within blocks, you're going to see significant variability often uh, for whether it's slope, angle, sun, soil texture, water availability within that site. You've got a river running through part of it you didn't even know about um, how it's being ma been managed historically. There's all these variables and that will produce significant variability that we can then identify with multispectral again satellite drone doesn't matter data to then find where that high quality fruit is uh and then pick that separately um and there's been lots of research done on this uh, i think showing quite typically quite a good return even for really boutique vineyards that you can use this to really hone in and find this block actually is giving us you know this sorry sub block right there's these maybe within a six acre block, there's maybe these two acres that just give killer fruit and we're just gonna turn it into just this little premium run uh, that we're gonna sell. And you can even use that in your marketing and things like that. So I think this is where it's kind of yield, labor, premiumization are probably the highest value uses. So one of the really interesting things is what uh, NDVI, and think about, again, this as Vigor correlates with. We're gonna look at some maps in a moment. Um, and it's, Really important to remember that, of course, NDVI is just picking up what could be a number of variables. It could be related to water. It could be related to management, you know, all these different things. But because it's vigor, there's something causing higher vigor. So when we see higher vigor, we're usually going to see higher yield. So your higher NDVI areas will typically be your higher yielding areas. But here's all these other things we're going to see. A higher winter pruning mass, leaf nitrogen, uh, humidity, disease risk, uh, great pH and potassium for those of you especially that are really worried about get your uh, great potassium levels getting too high, uh, trunk circumference. Uh, it's going to mature. It's going to take longer to mature, which of course makes sense if you have more vigorous part of the vineyard. It will slow. It will more slowly mature. Uh, you're going to see increased organic acids, berry weight, cluster size, bunch rot, and yet decreased wine color, phenolics, uh, lower bricks, lower quality when they've done research with tasting panels, decreased winter hardiness, heat, and uh, just overall efficiency. Because so what you're really seeing, of course, is there's a few things going on here. So like humidity, d disease risk, efficiency can often have to do with the size of the canopy. So you have a more vigorous, vigorous area. Um, you're going to have a larger canopy, which leads to some of these, you know, variables, uh, you know, that can then be managed, you know, same with cluster size. We're going to see larger cluster size, cluster, the grape clusters are going to be more pressed together because they're larger. And then we're going to see more risk of bunch rot or other diseases that have to do with kind of really tight bunches, um, really large clusters. So there's all these things, a lot of this actually can be controlled for. So if you do have a higher NDVI area, this is where, again, targeting and management, these can, can be really useful to understand because actually reducing that area. And I think this is, again, something that's useful to think about, even if you're not going to use this 
ever get multispectral done is that paying attention to where you have those higher vigor areas. And a lot of you probably are already doing this, but again, really, I think this is a useful way to, to this research is useful because it really shows how another way to think about this. And so you have this higher vigor area and really needing to spend time there because with higher vigor, you're seeing these disadvantages or depending on your site, it may actually be an advantage. You may want the higher end DVI. Um, in part just because typically you're going to see not always but you'll usually see a higher yield i just wanted to show one paper uh, just showing exactly this so you can see a uh, super clear relationship and I'm, I'm just highlighting one paper here because it, this is just common uh you know very very regular not 100 percent of the time but in most cases this is what you'll see so again the low vigor uh within the same block so again same management all that we have the same block and the areas that are of low vigor, they've got more anthocyanins, lower K plot, you know, potassium, lower malates, lower pH, great pH, higher bricks, um, you know, less, uh, a lower percentage of flesh, lower percentage of seeds, like, you know, lower, much less bunch rot uh, in this one trial is quite significant from, you know. Um, so anyways, just very clear relationships that we'll see between vigor levels. And it's important to remember that this is within a vineyard or within, this is one varietal within one block or blocks that are kind of all managed the same. So there's, uh, you know, this is, is related to something intrinsic to the vineyard, whether that's texture, water availability, whatever. So just quickly, I want to touch on, I've been talking a lot about NDVI. A lot of you are going to be really familiar, but actually, Whenever you're getting this work done, I just is something that's really important. You want to use NDRE. This is something specific to vineyards. It has to do with how, uh, let's go back here. It has to do with how uh, a canopy, especially with, if you have a split canopy, like a Geneva, a Geneva double curtain, it's much less of an issue. But if you have a VSP vertical canopy, what happens, and this has to do with the calculation. So Verizon, especially as your uh, canopy fills out, what happens is the red saturates. So you just, because it doesn't penetrate the canopy because of how the light works with the leaves. So you just get this consistent uh, color that doesn't tell you as much. It's not, it's still useful, but it's not nearly as useful as NDRE. NDRE is the same as the calculation as NDVI, except rather than using the red, it uses the red edge uh, wavelength or part of the spectrum which red edge correlates with chlor. That's again, where we see chlorophyll. So this is a much better, this is a metric of kind of chlorophyll content, but also it pen the red edge penetrates the canopy. So if you compare these, these are exactly the same time of day, just one's NDVI, one calculation is NDRE. And you can see much more variability with NDRE. And that's because NDRE is penetrating the canopy. NDVI saturates out just with the top. You're just getting a top down look at the canopy and NDRE picks up metrics within the canopy itself to, give, to sh kind of more accurately showcase some of what's going on in that case. And again, we can see the same thing here at flowering, quite a big difference, even at flowering where we're kind of seeing saturation at points, but NDRE is actually saying, hey, there's actually more problems going on here that are not obvious. So when you're, uh, if you're, this is specific to drone work, well, actually, if, and satellite as well, but you can, uh, I would always use NDRE over NDVI except in specific cases. And the vast majority of the research we've talked about with NDVI is applicable. Uh, it just gives us a bit more variability and accurate picture within a vertical uh, canopy. So let's look at some examples. So here we have this vineyard and now uh, what I ignore, I uh, just want you to ignore the cover crops. Often, usually we'll remove this. We'll talk about that later, but in this case, we haven't yet. So um, ignore the cover crops and just look at the vine rows. And on the left there, 2021, just look at how relatively or fairly healthy that is. Look at, we see, uh, so the color scale here, actually, let me bounce back here just to explain the color scale that we're using. We use what's called a heat map. So hot colors, so your reds, your bright reds are higher values, so higher vigor higher chlorophyll content and the dark cool colors, So the blues are lower chlorophyll content. So obviously the soil, no chlorophyll, it's blue. Um, yellows and greens are kind of in the middle. Again, think of it as a heat scale. Like you're looking like a thermal image or something. So again, on the left here, 2021, we're seeing actually pretty good. You know, it looks decent um, doing overall pretty, you know, pretty good. And then we go to 2022 and, and you can actually tell we see a lot more cover. The cover crops have actually grown a bit. 
um, and a bit more widely spaced. But look at some of those gaps we're seeing in the vine rows themselves. So again, ignore the intro row, but look at those gaps in the vine rows. And what, if you look back to 2021, we see actually they're growing um, from some of those areas where actually there's a bit of lack of health. And so what we know in this site that there likely was, uh, uh, there's a real concern about potential diseases. And so what we can do is we're both monitoring it over time to see is it spreading in kind of a classic disease pattern where we're actually seeing an expanding area. That's what it seems like. We'd really want another year to confirm, but this will both help us target this area um, and also just really pay attention to where it is and flag it and map it. Um, and even just maybe where we need to uh, replant to arrest it. If we don't want to do a whole vineyard replant, if it turns out to be a disease, you get in there, you cut down some vines, um, then at least we know kind of where we need to be to stop it and we can monitor it. Uh, here's a second example. So what this is, is this is just a um, management zone map. So uh, this is a vineyard, uh, remove the blocks uh, just to make it, um, uh, just not to identify the vineyard. I uh, actually really could, but so how this works is for us is the dark green is higher values. The yellow is low values. The light green is in the middle. So uh, this is again, NDRE. So think chlorophyll. So we're going to see, um, first of all, uh, we're seeing an expanding. So ignore the high yield, high quality. That's kind of generally the difference. I'll talk more about that later. But the 2021, we see this dark green area. Um, so we expect something similar in 2022. And actually what happens is we start to see a collapse. So you see that yellow, that low chlorophyll area uh, is expanding. And we see the dark green has shrunk quite a bit from 2021 to 2022. Uh, on its own, we can't say if this is disease or anything. Um, but we know from talking to the vineyard that, again, there's a real concern about pests in this case. Uh, specifically, I think this year was leafhoppers, where they this is something they saw here. And so we can actually track and map that and see its effects, um, kind of where that happened. Or maybe actually we think it's leafhoppers, but there's disease because we see this area expanding. So again, it's you can't say definitively just with two years of data, but this is something now we can start tracking and based on ground truthing, you always need to ground truth this data, something we're concerned about and now can monitor. So let's start looking at some other examples. First of all, ah, so this is actual leafhopper data. Um, some poor intern had to go out and uh, map on, in Excel. So it's not gonna map up perfectly just because we're kind of overlaying an Excel table, but look on the left, 2021. So again, that dark green, that's high chlorophyll, typically is gonna correlate with NDVI. Not perfectly, but we'd expect often more vigor there. And what we saw in this vineyard is actually the previous year's uh, NDRE values generally correlated quite well with where the areas that were hardest hit by leafhoppers. So again, can you get a return? You know, how useful this information is kind of up to you if you want to use it or not. Um, you know, is this actually saving you time knowing maybe next year where you're really going to be at risk of leafhoppers or other pests? Um, this might be valuable. It might not depending on how you use that information, but I think that is super interesting. Uh, two. So here's the second example. So now we're going to look at what's called uh, plant cell density, um, which is another algorithm. It's just near infrared. I think it's divided by red. I uh, can't remember off the top of my head, but it really correlates well with plant water status. So this is actually a, a useful data you can use, um, to map what your, um, plant water status is at that time. So, and it actually, unsurprisingly, in a lot of cases, correlates beautifully with yield better than NDVI, which already does a great job. Um, so what you're seeing here at the top there the, is yield. So that's a yield map they did. And then they compared it to a couple maps they'd taken previously in the season. The LWP is just a pressure bomb. So they did some really high density pressure bomb readings um, and generated a map from it. And then the bottom is the set is the, either, I don't know if I remember if it was drone or satellite plant cell density. So again, think water status and just look how well that PCD map correlates with yield. So again, in terms of how you're planning and thinking about your yield, where you're expecting your yield variation, uh, PCD is going to give you, um, really good data that way. And this is one, again, one of the big uses, whether you're using NDVI or plant cell density PCD for that. Uh, and then here is another PCD map and we have a client on the bottom right and not a client in the left. And you can just really see in this case, quite obviously, remember heat map. So the red hot colors are higher value. So the red is really high. We're just seeing over uh, significant overwatering. This might be over nitrogen as well, but defin definitely uh, that's absolute overwatering. 
which is going to pose real problems for that vineyard and really decrease quality. So this is just kind of a fun and interesting way to another way to monitor that information. Um, third example. So this is just something you there's new software coming out. Um, you know, we do this manually. It's more time intensive and you have uh, other people, other, other services now that are just starting to come out that do this automatically. Um, so again, where you're getting your satellite or drone provider might have software that will automatically do. So each of these rectangles is a, um, plant and with, for us again, dark green is what we would maybe call a well, lot more chlorophyll. So probably healthier, but not necessarily the best quality more on that later, and the light green or white is is missing. So you can even use this actually for uh, missing plant count. So if you're wanting to identify where you maybe have dead or uh, dying plants in your vineyard, this is a, can be a useful way to really see uh, another way to represent that same data. Okay, this is really interesting. So um, again, the, you're looking at a management zone of NDRE. So this is 2021 flowering in Verizon. This is all the same area, obviously. And so what we see here, first of all, is a normal progression. So we're seeing... Uh, again, light green, so less chlorophyll. Obviously, the plant is absor- is creating more chlorophyll in the leaves uh, as the season progresses. So at Verizon, we kind of see a nat- what we would expect in terms of natural progression, where we're now seeing areas that were medium green have now become uh, darker green, and, and medium green has expanded as more chlorophyll is in the vineyard. So this is kind of a normal transition we would expect. And you can use information for things, so you could... For example, use the 2021 data. If you for flowering, we'll use that to spray micronutrients. A lot of foliar sprays uh, can really help balance out a vineyard. But this didn't happen in this case. So now let's go to 2022. So we looked at 2022, and actually, super interesting. Uh, it's actually almost advanced. So 2022 almost looks like a continuation of 2021. So things are progressing nicely. We're seeing a you know overall increase in chlorophyll. Uh, we normally would be happy about this. And so now what we would expect is the same thing in 2021, where now we're just going to see an expansion as the vineyard absorbs more chlorophyll, which is just normal pattern uh, through, you know, from flowering to Verizon. And actually we see the opposite. So we see an actual collapse. Um, so what happened? Uh, this is a whole question we could spend a lot of time talking about. Uh, kind of interesting. Something happened within that vineyard so that plant health, um, chlorophyll content in this case, we're kind of assuming treating like plant health in this case, uh, significantly reduced. So uh, we suspect in this case disease, but also there are also management variables that could have had an impact where um, maybe the vineyard was fertilized a bit too much earlier in the season. And so it just kind of pushed, you know, it it kind of absorbed resources a bit too uh, readily. That is, you know, it just kind of grew too much. It kind of uh, almost... It's not quite technically correct, but you almost seem to be just peaking a little bit early and then we see a bit of a collapse. Again, we think it's disease, maybe pests in this case, uh, but this is really interesting so that we see this collapse. And when you compare the 2021 Verizon to 2022, we see, uh, you know, def- definitely worse results. And this is something that really needs to be monitored. So what are some other uses? First of all, I think one of the things you can do with drones, which is quite cool, is you can just remove the inter-row canopy. It really just helps you see just the canopy. Um which is really nice. Say, I'm just gonna jump back to some of the other maps. So here, that's not a great example. Uh, we can see here again the cover crops, right? Make it a bit harder, not impossible, just a bit more challenging to interpret the data. And so one of the nice things with drone data specifically, because how drone data is captured, uh, we can remove the uh, canopy to kind of see where the uh, where it is. Um, you know, without cover crops, which is nice. Uh, also with drone data specifically, you can do frost and water flow mapping. So again, this is a vineyard where, it, cause you can create 3D canopy models and, and uh, soil models. And so what we've done here is we've kind of mapped how the water will flow over that property. Okay, so let's compare in general. So that's one of the advantages of drones, but there are some other kind of important things when you're evaluating whether drone and satellite, we'll talk about that in a second, but I think one of the big differences in pixel size. So. Uh, you can get free satellite that's 10 meters. So you can get this, which is great at the regional scale, uh, using lots of research that way. It's just not useful at the lo- for most local vineyards because of the size. I mean, you just you look at that image on the left, you can't tell much of anything. You can get paid satellite down to two meters. Um, it becomes a bit, ch- if you don't have cover crops, this is uh, any sort of cover crops, you're just like on sand or you keep the soil bare, this becomes feasible. It's quite cheap. So if you if that's an option for you, this actually will be very cheap. Um, down to the one meter, it's a bit better. Uh, again, same thing as the two meter, just a bit better. And you, you don't 
So you can get it decently cheap, probably not worth it at that point, per, I think in most cases. But where we really see drone and satellite data become comparable is at the uh, really high end. Uh, these are usually the Worldview 3 satellites. So this is, on the left is a satellite, uh, you know, typical what you'd get from say, like a Worldview 3, uh, like planet, stuff like that. That's around half meter. Um, where we can actually see the rows and things like that. And then the on the right is one of our drone images, uh, same vineyard, uh, same image, except we're at the 0 0.04 meter, so around four centimeter pixel size. So half meter pixel size, four centimeter pixel size, but it's roughly comparable. Uh, there's not, you know, there's some advantage, there's some other advantages with the drones, but at that pixel size, it's not huge unless you're going to remove the inter row cover crops, which you can really see here. And again, if you don't have the if your soil is bare, then this becomes a lot easier. Uh, and typically, it's definitely worth it to go with satellite. So what are the weaknesses and disadvantages of each? First of all, for U UAVs, um, it's more time intensive for you. You need to have a license to fly. Uh, it's not cheap. You know, it's not expensive. I mean, we charge around $30 an acre typically. Um, a little site dependent. But uh, you can find people who are cheaper than that. But then you just have to be willing to interpret the data yourself because they're a drone pilot, not a... Uh, uh, they're not a cons you know kind of informed consultant, um, which is fine if you can do that. Uh, that's a great way to go about it. Um, if you're not doing it yourself, it's really only profitable to fly once to two times a year max, which was a weakness compared to satellites. Uh, if you have your own camera and you can process, uh, I would be flying very often because uh, you can actually really track things and get some super cool data. Uh, even like when you're about to move through different stages, you'll get a great notice, picking time, all that kind of stuff. Um, you also usually need more than one year to get real value, which is also true of satellites. Uh, and the seven and eight, that's not a typo. You really need someone who understands the data. You, the, it, and that can be absolutely be you. Uh, if you want to invest a bit of time, I think that's great. I think that's, you know, can really be worth it. But you'll just get a map. And I think this is just critical because you're going to see significant variability between providers. So you have some agricultural specific providers or vineyard specific providers. I think that's where the, you know, that's kind of something you really need, unless you can interpret it yourself, in which case, great. But you need, it's critical, you need someone who understands the maps. Uh, satellite, um, you can get cheap satellite data, but it's going to be too pixelated for the vast majority of you, um, unless you're a huge property. Um, and then it's roughly comparable, I think, you know, for most vineyards, unless you're huge, uh, really, really big, or, or your vineyards are spread over a huge area, which is also a risk. Uh, you're starting at around 3500 US roughly, but there can be significant variability in price there. Um, you, I would be looking at around the half meter resolution typically uh, for most vineyards. Um, clouds can interfere. So if you have like time, if you're, you want it around certain times and then it's cloudy for a week, that can pose a challenge. There's atmospheric sensor noise, color distortion issues specific to satellite. We'll talk about a solution for that in a moment. Uh, you can't get a digital elevation or 3D model like you can with drones. Um, it's very difficult to remove that into row vegetation. Absolutely not impossible. It's just it's harder than with a drone because you don't have the, the canopy model to use. Um, it's definitely ideal if you're doing regional work. You Satellite almost always is going to be better. Uh, and there's also some important variations in terms of the local environment. So the, there's advantages and disadvantages of each. The UAV is a lot more variable in terms of the quality you're getting because it depends on the person, consultants, or yourself. Um, satellites you can get a lot more frequency which i think is great but there's also some customization and localization you don't get so pluses and minuses to each so let's talk uh other tech um first of all you have thermal so you have thermal drone cameras and satellite which really what relates well to crop water stress um you have lidar so you have this cool new thing called uh, lidar they use it for all kind of mapping it penetrates the canopy it's actually the best way to generate a dem of your property, do your frost flow mapping, but to be honest, uh, drone images will be good enough. You can actually create that model from the images from in a process called photogrammetry. But uh, the cool thing is they're now mounting these on tractors and other devices and doing bun automated bunch counting through machine learning, which obviously uh, you just drive your tractor, do some spraying and you find out exactly how many bunches you have. That's not there yet in terms of value, but that is coming. You also have handheld ground versions of all of these. So you can get handheld and DVI sensors. You can mount thermal cameras on, you know, inexpensive cameras on poles and then monitor certain parts of your crop automatically constantly 
for like water stress or things like that. So there's kind of cool things if you want to dive a bit more deeply, you can do with all this tech just on ground mounting on certain parts of your vineyard. Uh, there's also uh, EC soil mapping. I just have to mention it because it is a remote sensing technology related to this. That's where you're doing soil uh, mapping. I think it's amazing, but as far as I know, only us and Pedro Pera in the Okanagan and probably the Pacific Northwest do it. So uh, that this, if I talk more about this, it's just a plug for us, which I'm not going to do other than if you're interested, let me know. But I also photography, I have to mention, obviously is a other use of drones, um, just straight up photography. So, okay. What's coming? What do you have to look forward to? First of all, hyperspectral. So here's our image on the left where we have, you know, four or five layers we're running our calculations from. Well, hyperspectral is just a continuous band. It is amazing what they're starting to get from hyperspectral. Um, we're just a bit early. First of all, the tech is super expensive. So you're really only seeing it used in research plots. I talked to one drone provider in Australia that uses it, but I mean, they had to like, uh, the costs are in the hundreds to hundred, hundred thousand to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, to operate and process this data. It generates such huge data, you can't run it on a local machine. You've got to use a cloud server like with Amazon or something. All that to say, what's coming is going to be amazing. I think this is going to, once we get to hyperspectral where it's affordable, uh, and that might happen with satellites first, uh, it's going to really, t and once the research, we have enough research, it is going to take off where you can do targeted mapping, say for uh, diseases. So you can go, okay, I want to fly and I want to, I'm going to fly this. And then I'm going to actually look through and see if I have, what disease I have with the hyperspectral, uh, really targeted, not having to go do a lot of ground truth thing or kind of guessing based on what else you're seeing or cutting open vines, but super targeted, uh, nutrients. I mean, it's, it's going to be wild. Uh, we're just not there yet. Practically. Yeah. It's, it's just a cost issue and, and we need more research. The other super cool thing that's coming is just the machine learning AI, which we started a bit with ChatGPT. Um, just the, it's just going to improve all the quality of this information. So what I'm showing you there is actually some of the lidar bunch counting uh, is being used with those weed zapping robots. Uh, there's just a lot of really cool things. We're doing some work on machine learning. Um, we did one study, just kind of interesting, where we looked at NDVI. We looked at high density soil mapping with like a, um, I think around 50 nutrients. We did. Um, and we, and some like, including some um, soil algorithms we we kind of come up with and found with others. And it just was really cool to see it, what correlates with yield. And so we actually have all of them uh, with this initial study we did with some students uh, back East found that it actually was one of these soil algorithms that did the best correlation with yield in this, in this vineyard. Need a lot more research and work to validate that, but I thought that was pretty cool. So uh, let's talk some tips and tricks. Um, First of all, okay, if you want to go take some photos, I'll show you some cool photos after this. Just go get a DJI Mini 3. You can fly it yourself. You don't need a license. Probably all in. I think it's around 1.5K uh, if you want to do that. You can hire someone again, but that's one option. Uh, if you want to go do multispectral work yourself, uh, you're probably looking at around 8K plus maybe a bit more for software. The real issue, obviously 8K is a lot of money, but um, the real challenge is just a learning curve and obviously time for yourself. Uh, if you're flying UAV, two algorithms right now you want to look at uh, is for the vast majority of you is NDRE or PCD. So if you have someone doing it for you, or if you're flying yourself, uh, what you want is NDRE and well, really and PCD and to look at both of those. Uh, one for chlorophyll content relates to all those kind of NDVI metrics, the other for plant water status. Uh, if you're using satellite data, use EVI. It just has the has to do with the atmosphere. It corrects for an issue with NDVI we often have with satellite data. Um, one of the, oh, one of the other great things about satellite data I didn't mention is that you have... Uh, they just can bring a lot more machine learning tools to bear, say, than us as an individual consultant on some of this data. So in some cases, there can be some specific advantages uh, if they're doing a good job of that, uh, just in terms of kind of the combined resources on this data. So anyways, if you're getting satellite data, use EVI, uh, not NDVI, just because of atmospheric interference. Uh, that happens with NDVI, but not EVI. Um, I think just one of the critical role parts, which we kind of talk, tying this back to the beginning, is really just think about what goals you're after, uh, what you want to get out of this for your grapes in terms of quality. You know, there's lots of things you can do, even with targeted soil sampling, for example. I was just reading a research paper recently that, oh shoot, I'm going to get these numbers wrong, but it was something like if you did your normal, let's say you had 10 acres and you took two soil samples, the actual error for your nutrient rate, just from a mathematical perspective, it's like 50% or something. Like it, it can be quite significant um, because there is so much variability. And so using tools like multispectral to help you target where to take your samples can really bring down that error rate. That's just a small example. 
and I think really the impact that really matters is the impact it has on the wine and your profitability. And I think there's really clear uh, cost benefit analysis benefits um, that can turn into real dollars. But there has to be a plan in place to, to do that, whether, again, it's satellite, drone, doesn't matter. And then also when to do it. Um, usually Vraison, uh, again, this is if you're just doing it a couple times, one or two times. Vraison is absolutely the most common, especially if you're just getting one image. Uh, it has the most carryover into the next year because the vine is not really going to change that much. You really have information on how that vine is going to behave until you really start messing with it. So really until uh, you really get into flowering next year. And even then, the data often seems to kind of carry through. Obviously, we know kind of these two-year cycles with vines. So if Raison is the most common, most bang for your buck. But if you want to impact that year, you can either do just do flowering or do flowering of Raison. And flowering is when we're going to really target those micronutrients because of obviously the impact of the vine between flowering and Raison. So I would use flowering data to then really target my foliar sprays, target the areas that are going to need more fertilizer, uh, however you're applying that um, to kind of bring the vine vineyard more into balance or quality parameters, whatever. So I just let it in, just showing you some cool photos we took, just to give an idea of some kind of cool, fun marketing stuff you can do. This is in France. Um, just kind of, you know, these are easy. We're not, we, we take photos, but we're not photography specialists. Uh, this is just, you know, we kind of mostly do this just for fun, but you can kind of see some of the really cool stuff you can get from marketing. So I think this is one thing where you can get some really good value just out of getting yourself a little drone. You can pay someone to do it, uh, you know, not opposed to that, but I think, you know, again, even on yourself, just yourself, you can, or just one of your staff members um, can get up there. So uh, that's our talk. Um, I really don't think I'm, oh, I, one thing I did miss was just one of the cool things too is near infrared correlating with soil microbes. So there's some cool research there just using the near infrared layer. Um, oh, and UAV for, bi there's some, with the spraying, there's some cool stuff with biocontrol. So people are doing some testing. I, that's one thing I missed with the drone spraying. Uh, was they're using uh, biocontrols with UAV to kind of do some targeted uh, biocontrol applications is, is pretty cool. And I think the oh, and the other thing, just obviously, a lot of this has to do with I didn't put sustainability in there, but a lot of this obviously helps with sustainability. So, anyways, uh, drones, you know, is a small part of what we do. It's probably ten percent of our business. So, I want to be really clear. I'm not talking about this data to push our work, um, you know, we're happy to do it, but it's a small part of what we do. I'm showing you the multispectral because I think this is where uh, there was real value and a chance to actually get a good return on your dollar. We ourselves, as you can see here, do a ton of other stuff. Uh, we do EC mapping, precision irrigation, um, all kinds of other things really around kind of precision viticulture uh, using implementing technology where it serves the farmer to really seek to improve yield and quality and farm more sustainably. So, this is who we are, happy to chat, answer questions. If you have anything, if you watch this, shoot me a message, uh, happy to chat more, just kind of explain some of what's going on. And just really ultimately the goal is to help you farm more sustainably, better quality fruit, more profitably. So I hope this has been really useful for you to that effect.